Hello, we're back here again for the third time in this uh, kind of a shutdown that we're experiencing in our whole, our whole world today. And it's Easter, the central, the central truth of all the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ focuses around the truth of the message that we share at Easter time. It's, it's a fantastic truth and it's distinctive to the gospel message. He is risen. That truth is resonant throughout all of the age of history since, since the event actually took place. I'm sharing here from the scripture, from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, and it's John's account of Mary going to the tomb and finding the tomb empty. And there's a couple things I should probably mention at the very outset. One is that uh, there is some difference between the the way that each of the gospel writers, the four gospel writers, uh, approach this event and, and what they have to say about it. First of all, there's, of course, John only mentions Mary having come, and come first to the tomb. I think Mar uh, Matthew, uh, the, Matthew at least, I believe, mentions two women and uh, Luke mentions several people coming to the tomb. And I've, uh, there's been a lot of discussion of that over the years. Uh, Bible critics and commentators have, have discussed it. But one of the things that I've thought about in connection with that, uh, when Mary came back and talked and spoke to Peter and John, and we'll be approaching that here in just a minute, but when she came back and told Peter and uh, John about the tomb being empty, I cannot imagine that Peter and John were the only ones of the disciples during that first day that ever went back to look at the tomb. I know for my part, if I had been there at that time, knowing my curiosity and my disposition, the first thing I'd wanted to do is follow Peter and John or get there ahead of them. Uh, and I, I have wondered, and there's no way to verify this one way or the other, but I have wondered how many people went to that tomb that first day to verify for themselves that the tomb was empty and things were just not that they necessarily questioned Peter and, uh, and John and Mary, but more to the fact that I just want to see it. I want to see it for myself. At any rate, there is some difference between the the way that the story is related, I would expect that anyway with four people testifying and especially one of them testifying from the history that he's researched himself and went asking people about the event because he wasn't there. So we're looking at John chapter 20 and the first 12 verses of that chapter. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to, Saint, to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloth lying there, 
yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen, linen cloth lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen, linen cloth but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture or understand the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own home, but Perry, but Mary, stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. A couple of things here that, that I want to highlight just a little bit. First of all, I think it's Matthew, and I didn't double check that here just in the last few minutes, but I think it's Matthew that says that there were two women. One of, one of the writers mentioned three, mentioned Joanna also, and, uh, and John only mentions one, one Mary alone going to the tomb. However, when she approaches Peter and John, she says, they have taken away the Lord, and we don't know where they've laid him. Now that, that indicates to me that she very well was accompanied in reality when she went to the tomb, or yes, when she went to the tomb, but she, only she went running back to Peter and John. That's just, uh, uh, of course, speculation or an opinion on my part, but it does seem to indicate that, that there were more people there when she first observed the tomb. The other thing is, it appears to me, and I'm kind of reading into this, uh, it appears to me that uh, Mary must have followed Peter and John back to the tomb. Because it says here that in John's testimony, it says here that she, she ran and told Peter and, and John, but at the, or she's described as the disciple whom Jesus loved, but John's writing this, and it's always been assumed that, that was, he's speaking of John. Uh, but it, this, this indicates that after Peter and John left the tomb, Mary was still there. And if we'd have read on, we'd find that not only was she still there, but she, when she looked in, she saw the two angels that were in there at that time. And then she further apparently uh, confronted Jesus. She was confronted by Jesus, didn't recognize him until... He called her by name. And I, I could spend quite a little time talking to you about, about uh, Jesus calling you by your name. Because I think that's going to be an exciting time in our future. Now, I said a little bit ago that the really distinctive truth that the, that the, of the whole message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is, it's not the whole story, but it is the central theme of the gospel message that Jesus rose from the dead. And if you look at, uh, you read the whole account and you see how that message was was uh, dealt with by the scribes and Pharisees and those who had had uh, convicted him of some trumped up charges so that they could uh, execute him. When you see how they treated the message when it came back to them, there's two or three things that, that stand out about that. 
in the first place, the one central thing that, that Paul ran into difficulty with in his whole preaching ministry from the very beginning was the people who confronted him and opposed him on the basis of his message of the resurrection. Over and over again, the, the Pharisees, uh, the Pharisees party did not believe in, in life after death. Uh, the Greeks did not believe in it. Uh, the, it. On every hand, there was opposition to him over that one central message that he is risen. And it was the hallmark call of the Christian church in those early days. He is risen. And people responded to that message with, He is risen again indeed. indeed. That, that truth shook the world of that day. And it also was responsible for getting the message of the gospel out across the globe. I want to read and, and, and look at a portion of scripture in the book of Hebrews that talks to us about what that message has done and what the what the real down-to-earth effects of the resurrection really are and he describes it in the message it's described for us in the message to the letter to the Hebrews and I'm looking at chapter 10 and beginning with verse 11. And we're going to go through this rather uh, slowly and, and just highlight it as we read because I want us to, to get the feel, if we can, of what is being said here, what, what this truth really means for us. And he says here in verse 11, And every priest talking about the early priesthood under the Mosaic law, every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. The priests under the Mosaic law had daily sacrifices. They had sacrifices for special occasions. They had sin offerings for certain uh, at certain occasions and by certain prescribed rules and regulations. And, and this went on day after day after day, and that sacrifice was offered over and over and over again. The lamb was sacrificed or the goat was sacrificed. Whatever the sacrifice was, it was offered over and over again because none of those sacrifices were sufficient to actually accomplish the very purpose for which it was done. It did have the effect of reminding the, the people of that day that they were guilty. It also reminded them, because they had to search out a sacrifice that was without spot or blemish, it reminded them that it took a perfect offering in order to accomplish its purpose. And it also reminded them that they had, it was necessary for them to repeat it over and over and over again. And then it says, but this man, after he had, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, which is himself, sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies were made his footstool. After he had made this one sacrifice, and it's the one that is effective for all time. This wasn't some kind of a pantomime game that was played, that Jesus played over and over to each generation. That's why it's so absolutely critical that when you search out the evidence of the New Testament scripture, and see that there, 
that the testimonies are very clear and there is ample evidence that this actually did happen, then you are held responsible for believing or not believing. And it's because, it was because Adam did not really believe God that he failed and ate of the fruit that, that God commanded they should not eat. He did not really believe and trust God. And, and I believe that's the reason the scripture is very clear and so adamant that it is because we believe that we're saved. By faith, we are saved through faith. Through faith, it, by the grace of God. From that time, waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. From that time, he is waiting until he takes complete and total control of all of the world. He, that will be the victory day. That will be the time when all of it comes to fruition. And it is going to happen. For by one offering, he has perfected forever, or he has uh, matured forever, those who are being sanctified. By the whole, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he has said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts and in their minds I will write them. In other words, it's the Holy Spirit who has testified of this and has made it clear to us and is sanctifying those who are believing. Then he adds, and their sins and their lawless deeds, I'll remember them no more. He has made that atonement. And he has proved that his ministry and his works are effective because he rose again. It is, it is the death on Calvary, Calvary's cross that paid the price for our sin. But it's the empty tomb that proves that he can offer the reward of eternal life to, the, to those who really will believe. I'll put my law in their hearts and in their minds I'll write them. This is not just a bunch of laws, rules and regulations that I read about once. They're written in our hearts and minds. Now where there is remission of these, there's no longer an offering for sin. I misunderstood that years ago. But what it's really saying is, when there is once a real remit, uh, remission for our sins, there is no longer any need for a continual sacrifice. It is done. He has accomplished it. It's a finished product. There is nothing more that needs to be done to make the atonement for our sin. Therefore, brethren, having boldness, we can, to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Up until the, that, that event on the cross at Calvary, up until that time, the high priest was necessary once a year to go into the Holy of Holies and offer for the sins of the people. But he was the only one that could go in there, and he better be prepared with the right uh, preparations that were, that were prescribed by the Mosaic law, or he wouldn't come out alive. And, and uh, it was only him that could go in there, into the, into the Holy of Holies. But when that, when Jesus gave up the Spirit, and the thing was done, the scripture says that the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. That certainly tells us that, that it wasn't man that tore the veil in two. And that veil was a huge, heavy, heavy gar uh, uh, 
veil that hung down from the ceiling of the of the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from the people. And the scripture here tells us by a new, and, uh, wait a minute. Therefore, brethren, having boldness, what a word, boldness, to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. When that veil was torn in two, that was God standing at the door or at the opening of the veil and inviting his people into his very presence, into the inner chamber. He consecrated this for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let's draw near with a true heart and a full assurance every confidence because our hearts are sprinkled from an evil conscience and are and we are made clean i am sure that this was making a reference to water baptism in a sense but it's talking about something even beyond that it's talking about the fact that the blood of jesus christ washes sin clean it, it washes it away as far as our guilt and our responsibility. Let us hold fast the confession. Tell others about it, of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful. You know, God's never been late for an appointment. Never in his whole life. And his life did not have a beginning and it has no ending. He's never missed an appointment and when he says he is coming again, there's something, there's a simple truth there that I can share with you. He's coming again. And, and what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. If he says it, it's a done deal. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. This truth most certainly should affect our day-to-day -day con uh, conduct. Everything we do, every move we make, should be affected by the reality of what we've just read about right here. Draw, full, draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I can still remember the day that I kneeled down in my parents' home and, and turned my life over in repentance to Jesus Christ. I can remember how light I felt because I knew the sin was forgiven wasn't that I was perfect at that point. It wasn't, it wasn't that that suddenly uh, changed everything about me. God has been in the business of reframing ever since. But I remember that event, and remember it very well, because it's such a fresh, new approach and experience that I've never felt in any other realm at all. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Keep it, keep it coming, folks. Keep it, keep it, keep that heart on fire. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, 
Boy, we sure had to stretch that in the last few weeks, haven't we? Because of because of the actions that have been taken concerning this uh, uh, COVID-19. And uh, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. You know, there are people who go about their lives refusing to, to participate and professing Christ, but refusing to participate with other Christians for whatever reason they happen to choose. But the problem is, it's off, iron sharpens iron. And it's very difficult to grow when there's nobody that's helping to cultivate the garden. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Every day you look around you, you can see the evidence that the, that the fulfillment of God's promises and the fulfillment of the Word is imminent. I don't know when Jesus is going to return. I don't know when these things are, when he's going to fold up the heavens like a scroll, as the scripture describes. I don't know when all this is going to happen, but I know it is. I know it is. And, and the biggest danger, folks, is the fact that God has, has tarried up to this point to give others an opportunity to get into the kingdom. Thousands, perhaps millions. He's tarried up to this point. But don't let that tarrying cause you to think it's not going to happen. He'll be back. And when he comes, it'll be just like he said it was going to be. This is the heart of the gospel message. The message says, He is risen. I'm here to, tell you, to share with you today, Jesus Christ was not in that tomb. Mary couldn't find Him. The two disciples couldn't find Him. None, no one ever found Him. Uh, Ravi Zacharias, I heard Ravi Zacharias one time, a couple of different times on messages that he was preaching make the statement that Christianity has laid itself very much open to if anybody wants to debunk Christianity, the only, the only thing they have to do is find a corpse. They, I'm sure that the scribes and Pharisees wanted to find the corpse. I'm sure that the that uh, Pilate would have liked to have found the corpse. There's a lot of people that would like to find the corpse, by find Jesus' body. But they can't find it because he's sitting up there uh, next to his father, waiting for the day when he's to return back here. May God grant you a glorious, glorious resurrection day. Amen.